And when, you know, the intro for Moonchild comes along and bam, and Bruce Dickinson comes jumping on stage screaming, I am he. From that moment, from the, when the pyros went off, from that moment, I never had a plan B with my life. You know what I like in you, in your music? We never know what to expect. I think people, you know, at least those who have followed me for a while, they're kind of prepared for the unexpected. You use a lot of dissonant chords, too. In, in the early days, it was just on pure instinct because none of us knew any music theory or anything like that. So it was just going by ear. And of course, at that age, you want to deviate from the formulaic structure of music. You don't want to make, you know, verse, chorus, uh, pre-chorus. You don't want to follow that because you're breaking all the rules. So the dissonance of my early work is probably just by pure instinct, trying stuff out and see what sounds good. Over the years, you know, I, I, I've accumulated some some more knowledge, uh, you know, of of some music theory, but still, it's very uneducated. You know, so but I'm I'm very happy about that because theoretical approaches or new concepts that for maybe someone who has a classical or or maybe a jazz you know education you know it would be old old news. But for me, it's like top shelf, so I can just pick anything. It's so complex at times that it's sometimes you need to have a little understanding of the theory to kind of grasp it or at least approach it. You know, in a very very simple way yourself. You've always been a composer. A lot of people play very well the instrument, but they never compose a song. And you've, since you were like a kid, you were a composer. Well, thank you. I mean, or, or songwriter, we, we, you know, composer seems very, very... Ambitious. Yeah, but it, it's not that I'm not ambitious. You know, I'm very ambitious, but, uh, but uh, you could say, if you say composition or songwriting, it's, I guess, just two side, sides of the same coin in a way my approach to music was always about uh, the the writing so so any any kind of technical abilities i learned over the years was just a means to express you know uh, you know music in in songs really so that has always been my my main motivation so i need some some fantastic musicians sometimes to to perform this music live, especially. <laughs> so so uh, yeah, so so I've I've been very fortunate to have some some very talented music and musicians with me. Do you use Leprous as a backing band? Yeah, not for not for many years now, because uh, they start they started out as my backing band, but uh, you know after some years, you know they became so successful on their own accord you know that our our schedules were bound to crash at some point but uh, the previous guitar player from leprous who is now left leprous he uh, he is now part of my my regular touring group so uh, it's it's all you know a lot of the same people involved I'm very curious about the reaction of Pharos. With the internet, you, you have like a, an instant reaction of the fans. How is it going? So, so far, you know, the little that I've picked up has been very positive. As, as, as you mentioned earlier, I think people, you know, at least those who have followed me for a while, they're kind of prepared for the unexpected in a way. But though, though I, I've been very upfront about my intention with these two EPs, you know, the Telemark EP that came out in February and this Pharos, that they would be kind of opposites. After the release of Telemark, I think people were prepared for the next one to be something entirely different because that's kind of how I, I presented it. It's almost like I, I tend to use food uh, analogies sometimes. And it's like, have you ever done, if, if, you, if you think you're getting a glass of milk and it's as a, a glass of orange juice, you know, it tastes like shit, but but if if you're pre prepared for it, you know, it, it's delightful. So so I think it's a it's a similar thing. Telemark, you sing in in Norwegian. 
And it sounds really aggressive, really good, man. I like it that. Thank you. Now, maybe it, a lot of people told me, and of course, the, the majority of my listeners are not Norwegian, uh, but but still, they I've had some feedback. They feel in some way that me singing in Norwegian gives it an even more aggressive uh, expression. And, and um, I kind of wondered what that is. I, I think there are some really, of course, some very hard consonants in the Norwegian language, but perhaps also... Um, it's with a added touch of more authority, you know, in confidence because I'm singing in my mother tongue. You are so used to, to, to composing in English that it's a natural thing for you now. Yeah, I think, I think I started, I probably started writing English lyrics when I was like 12, 13, you know, because all the music that I listened to was in English. So it's like, you know, I started writing with distorted guitars as well because all the music I listened to was... So it's kind of what you do. So it never really occurred to me to to express myself in in uh, in Norwegian. And, and and as a consequence, since since my music has always been... Aesthetics of it has always been kind of cinematic, if you will. You know, it, it's not like the close relation stuff. It's like the, the grand forest and uh, space and all these kinds of things. You know, the black metal vocal style is not my regular speaking voice, which is very good, I think, for most people around me. But, uh, but... Uh... I would like you to comment some songs, could you? Like Telemark, the title track. For me, it's an impressive track. Yeah, no, that is um, kind of special to me because... Um, uh, it has these uh, kind of Norwegian folk influences in the riffing, you know, because in, in relation to, to, to these two EPs and uh, uh, where I've kind of distilled out the two kind of opposing aesthetics of what I've been doing, there have always been, you know, the extreme part of my music, but they're all throughout my, my solo catalog, at least, you know, there's always been this kind of more mellow, popish, you know, more dynamic, I guess. For me, growing up with, as I said, Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and all these, there, where you feel, we grew up on, I'm assuming yourself as well, you, we grew up on albums. So it's not just about the single songs, it's how they fit together into a whole piece, you know, larger than the sum of their parts. Its parts. And, and that's how I want to make albums. And then with Telemark, you know, doing something purely for basic rock band, uh, you know, just with a brass section and just singing extreme vocals and kind of limiting myself to that, I would not find that natural to bring into a whole album. That w would not fulfill, you know, the, everything that I wanted an album to be. And also, I'm not really big on folk music. And, and it's such a strong musical texture. So I wouldn't, for any of my albums, I wouldn't find a place for that kind of tonal color in my in my music but for this specific pro project it was perfect so everything about that ep is is close to home close to my heart and and you know close to my my cultural roots my my musical roots my my geographical roots if you will and pharaohs as you know the title somewhat indicates and even the cover songs of pharaohs indicates you know like roads manhattan skyline it's something far away. And musically, it's something far away from what I have been doing. So, Can I tell you that I, I feel something about aha in your music? <laughs> At least oh, in, in summer. Summer moved on. Yeah, summer moved on. Yeah. There, there is that kind of mood of hunting high and low. Oh, thank you. No, but 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 that's that's why I I wanted to do that song because I I love Aha because it's the, the songwriting is uh, extremely well done, but also they have definitely have that element of the grandiose, you know, it's it's like for the song you know like uh, some moved on that stay you know it's a uh, it, it yeah it's it, it's larger than life and that's you know the, the appeal of everything and, and you see that in a lot of eighties music. You know, even though they didn't have the production techniques and everything that we have now, but still the intention 
was to make it larger than life. When we did, recorded the first Emperor albums, we had no experience, you know, but we had this kind of internal, we, we kind of made up for the lack of experience in this uh, whatever strong intent to make something that was super large. I, I would like to ask you about another song that for me is quite impressive. That's after, after the title track. I, I gave myself, when I started the solo thing, I gave myself uh, three albums, you know, to kind of establish my solo output. Because I didn't want to be, you know, one of those guys who kind of drop out of a, an already kind of established band and then just continue something in the same way. You know, so, so I wanted to be very, very, it was a very deliberate decision to, to build my own musical platform. You know, so that's why the first, you know, the adversary is much more, uh, you know, heavy metal. So, so uh, I started over in a way, and after was kind of where I ended up. I felt I was kind of with the uh, the adversary and angel, and then the last A of the three first A albums uh, was after. And as a, as the words suggest, it's kind of after as in a conclusion. And, uh, and the first two albums were very uh, kind of struggling. There were a lot of uh, Nietzsche and conflict and, and all that. But after, I just decided that there would be no sign of life in any lyrics, in any images. So this is just a, a totally atmospheric approach, you know, where everything happens within these kind of bleak landscapes. Once again, very cinematic the song too, huh? I think in, in the song after, this is the after. Yeah, it's like delving down, like, wow. What kind of band would you like to tour with for this album? That That's a tough one. Um, I, I, I would, of course, at some point, love to, to be touring with lepers again because uh, that is a, that is always a good match there, there has been some talk of uh, of me uh, at some point uh, supporting opus uh, which I think you know they're great friends of mine uh, an amazing band I think you know different you know mu musically I think it would be be also a, a, a good match you know so that that would be very cool but you know for, for me, when I'm doing touring, or uh, I'm not that specific. The most important for me, uh, when when traveling, or that be to festivals or wherever, is to to be with uh, with good people. That you that you kind of uh, weed out uh, too much of the the conflicting factors, and that everybody's having a good time. That is, that is the most important thing because without that, you know, uh, everything else suffers. You know, the production suffers, the sound suffers, and the band suffers, so. In the Night Side Eclipse, I think in one song, you gave the guide to other bands to do black metal. No? I am the Black Wizards. You brought something completely new, and a lot of bands followed that path. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, w I, w I wouldn't know that. I mean, it's um, in the Night of the Eclipse as, as an album, it's uh, it's kind of strange because there were, you know, like I'm the Black Wizards was of course pre-recorded in a different version on the first Emperor EP. So, but but I guess that ended up that ended up being one of our kind of classics. You know, one of those songs that we always play. I don't know what it is about it, but I think maybe there's something to again. Uh, the melodic element, you know, because it's a very it's a very recognizable melody. I have this strong memory of uh, of uh, playing on the Black Wizards in this uh, this club in Tokyo, and I think like three thousand people there, and they were singing along to that melody, you know, in louder than the PA, like whoa, so it was almost like a football chanting. Sometimes not with that, I think, but sometimes with to to some of in in a frustration, 
that always when he would bring in a rip, I would always try to mess it up with something else. And uh, and uh, and th this was the case with the uh, with and the Black Wizards, because the his riff was the opening part. You know the the E and then the F. So it's basically just two chords, but they're of course uh, diatonically kind of non-related. But still, I I had this inclination to try and fit you know, a melody on top of that, that would kind of bind it together and be more harmonious than just two kind of uh, two chords, a, sec uh, a small second apart. How old were you by that time when you recorded like the first album? Uh, the first, the first EP, I was sixteen. Uh, in Nice of the Clips, I was seventeen. So you've been to hell that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. H how big was the scene? Because here we think that it was really big, and was it big? Fifteen, twenty people, perhaps. <laughs> you know, and, the, and and this is was this was people that we we knew from in the Norwegian metal scene. You know, before it was even black metal. I remember, you know, Ibar from Enslaved, for example. The first time he came to to visit us, I think he was twelve. And and uh, you know the and we even me and Samos in previous bands to Emperor. You know, we went to to their city on the west coast of Norway to play shows. So it's um, that was you know a group of people that were all already interconnected before it kind of evolved into a black metal thing. And you used to hang out in the shop, listen to music, that they talk about a metal. How was that? Yeah, I, I um, it, it, every time there was a show or if we were, it was Euronymous, for example, who, who helped us book the studio uh, where we recorded the Emperor EP. It was very supportive like that. We, we got this, you know, we could sleep there, just bring a sleeping bag. So, so, um, so there was kind of a scene, but but it, it, to be honest, it, it was really always uh, Samoth who who had the kind of network. So and he he spent a lot of time. He he stayed there for a long while. And and Bord Faust, for example, for also you know from early Emperor, he he lived there and worked there for for a while. So so um, but me, of course, I, I I was there when there were shows and we were when we were in the studios and everything. But but uh, I was always more like. The ta somewhat tag along, and I did the music. I, di I did the music. He had the networking. <laughs> you know that Varg Varg recently talked about the the countries that he hated, and he talked about Brazil. <laughs> Was he always an asshole? Uh, but, um, from what I remember, I, I didn't know him that well, uh, so, but uh, he was always a very, kind of a happy guy. You know, he was always joking, and he was not as as gloomy as uh, I guess he's been portrayed after the fact. But uh, uh, for some reason, me and him never got along. We're just very different personalities, I think. So, uh, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say. I mean, he's he's kind of I've. I've gone in some different directions, uh, and I, I'm sure we could say he has been going in some different directions as well. <laughs> Isha, to, to finish here, three subjects. First of all, dogs. I, I, I see some pictures of you with your dogs, and how, how do you like pets, man? How many pets have you got? Oh, we, we, now we, we have two dogs. Uh, uh, until uh, yeah, f February last year, we, we had uh, three dogs. So, uh, but I, I, I was raised on a farm, so we always had a lot of animals, and uh, there was always a dog, of course. But uh, it's really also mainly a passion for, for my wife, who also grew up with, uh, with large dogs. It's such, I mean, to have them around, uh, it's a constant, because you, you know dogs, they, they live in the now. They don't care about yesterday, they don't care about tomorrow. And... Uh, as humans, we we tend to live so much outside of now, you know. So it's very nice, to, I think, to have have uh, you know some personalities in the house 
who just constantly remind you. And, uh, you know, they, they have uh, needs that need taken care of. You know, they, they're a large breed. They need at least, you know, for about an hour of, of good exercise, walking in the forest and everything. So it keeps me out of, gets me out of the studio, you know. And to finish here, do you remember your first show, your first concert that you went? Yeah, well, I, I did the, um, I, I did attend some smaller shows locally here. But, uh, of course, my first big rock show was Iron Maiden Seven Son of the Seven Son Tour. It was Seven Tour of Seven Tour, October 5th, 1988. And, uh, and this is a true story, and I've talked about this before. I was a very eager musician. You know, I had my guitar, I was playing in bands and everything. But then... <clears throat> from the moment you probably seen the show, right? And when you know the intro for Moonchild comes along, and bam, and Bruce Dickinson comes jumping on stage, screaming, "I am he!" From that moment, from the when the pyros went off, from that moment, I never had a plan B with my life. And last one, do you remember your first album, the first one that you bought, actually? Uh, yes, uh, that was, and that I, I bought that entirely by the cover because I was so keen on actually buying myself an album. And I was 10 years old and I bought Kiss Rock and Roll Over. I, I saved up money and I went to the record store with no, with no idea and just flipping through and, okay, I'm having this one. <laughs> just in talk. Body Higley. I thank you very much for this interview. I was very, very looking forward to do it because I really appreciated these two EPs. And I hope to see you down here playing live in Brazil. Please do it. Absolutely. And we, I mean, with Emperor, we're supposed to be coming to, to South America and we, we're still working on that. We put up some new dates. You know, we can't wait to, to be coming along. I mean, it's been our, on our to-do list for a long time. And then this whole pandemic thing happened. But uh, of course, every, everyone's affected. No one, so, so we, we all just have to make the best of it and hope we'll, uh, you know, it will be even more enjoyable when it first happens. I hope so, man. Thank you very much, Ishan. Thank you so much for the support. And uh, until the next time, stay safe. <laughs>